Welcome to a Thursday edition of the Ed Boston Podcast Network, and we started that off with a song that may be more relevant than what people give it credence to, Jesus is Coming Soon. Uh, got a, a full lineup of, of stories that we'll talk about from a Christian perspective tonight, and uh, just a bunch of stuff, and in a little bit, we might even get Amy to join in. She's just coming in from work, so we'll, we'll let her relax for a little while. And um, I don't know. We may talk about a couple topics that get her going pretty good. So uh, let's start it off with, with something a little more fun. How about that? Uh, I don't know I don't watch late night TV so now that Letterman and Leno are gone Ferguson's gone um, I don't even really know who's who I know Jimmy Fallon's on one of the shows uh, but the person who took Ferguson's place is a gentleman by the name of James Corden and I found out through my good friend over at TrevorDecker.com that uh, he is a very good Christian man who, um, who let's 
let's just talk about him. We're now living in a new golden age of late night TV, but ironically, one of its brightest stars is a name that until last spring, almost no one in the U.S. had heard of. Today, however, James Corden is becoming a full-fledged TV star, a viral video sensation, and even has a role in an upcoming animated family comedy, Trolls. Raised in a devoutly Christian home, Corden grew up attending church in the UK, but following a period of partying, loneliness, and heartbreak seven years ago, his life changed after an evening of prayer with his parents and a new perspective helped create one of TV's most infectious personalities. When CBS announced that James Corden would be taking over as host of the Late Late Show for Craig Ferguson, it seemed like a surprising choice. Not only was Corden basically unknown to U.S. audiences, but his skill set was dramatically different. At the time, he told Variety, it's madness, really. When I got the job, I'd never been on American TV talk show, he said. Mm -hmm. It's a bold choice, a really bold choice. Corden's brand of comedy is more vulnerable. It's like you're watching a funny friend, not just a talented performer. Uh, the story goes on to talk about how he went through a very difficult time in his life. Uh, that he got into partying and, and womanizing and he said sleeping in beds that he never even knew the people and different things like that and he got to a point in his life where he he just uh, didn't like he didn't like what he was even though he was uh, doing well in Europe uh, and one night his parents came over and he says they sat on the tiny two-seater sofa I, and I sat on the floor he said I was just talking to the floor, really. I felt embarrassment that they were seeing me like this, so embarrassed about so many things and the way I'd behaved or acted at points over the that seven or eight month period. And my dad stood up and walked across to where I was and he put his arms around me and said, you've just got to get through this, son. Corden said, I started to cry, just as you do when your dad hugs you and you are 30. My mom came over and joined us and we sat there. My dad saying, I'm going to say a prayer for you. It will be all right, but you can't carry on like this and only you can decide what happens now. And one of the reasons for selecting this to start off with is the example of the father here. Uh, we've all had times in our life where we needed to be a mentor for somebody or, or needed to be there for somebody that was having things difficult and, and I like the way his dad stayed calm didn't try to fix him himself because as he said um, you can't carry on like this and only you can take care of this Corden had to decide what was going to happen then, and uh, today, several years later, he's a husband and a father and a, has a successful career. He's becoming more well-known all the time. He's got a, a segment on his show that's um, gaining lots of popularity, and you can see YouTube videos of it. It's called Carpool Karaoke. Uh, it's a, its premise is to capture celebrities that isn't saturated in lights of Hollywood soundstage or in the context of some variety style game. They go out and they ride in a car and they sing. And <laughs> it's hilarious. So uh, you can go over to trevordecker.com uh, and find the article yeah. How Faith is in Jesus Christ Impacts James Corden's Life. And 
uh, read read the full article. I, I left part of it out. I got quite a bit of the gist of the story there. But uh, just thought we'd start out with something a little bit on the light side tonight. Um, we were pretty um, heavy into the um, tough subjects on <laughs> on Tuesday. Uh, my blood pressure rose a few. Well, actually, my blood pressure's been doing really good. I think I've been getting. I must have some good medicine they're giving me now. Uh, but uh, and we've got plenty of topics for tonight that uh, will irritate you. Uh, it'll irritate me, I know that. Uh, I've got a story that was up at edboston.com that um, we've covered for a while and we'll continue to cover it heav heavily because a week from today, the Ark Adventure opens, and of course I'm following them on Facebook, and I would suggest you do too, Ark Adventure. Uh, you can look up Answers in Genesis, you can look up Creation Museum, Answers in Genesis is the parent company, they own Creation Museum and now Ark Encounter. Uh, Ken Ham is flooding the airwaves with videos and appearances. Uh, he was talking on a video, a live video on Facebook earlier about uh, an NPR appearance that he had uh, debating with someone that was from the group Separation of Church and State. And uh, I got to tell you, he, he's quite a debater and does a great job uh, with knowing his stuff. Uh, there's one thing to know your stuff and then there's one another thing to be able to share that stuff and do it quickly, etc, etc, like you have to do in a debate and he is outstanding. Again, the Ark Encounter opens next Thursday, 7 7 16. I almost said 7 7 14. Uh -huh because that's the day Amy and I got married. So it's opening on our two-year anniversary. Uh, never know when we're going to make it over there to, to see it, but we are both excited uh, about that and uh, can't wait to see. But the article that I want to share with you uh, that was up on the front page of edboston.com in the... Uh, Christian news areas. We have three uh, feeds that go into there uh, with the latest in, in Christian news. Uh, this comes from CBN. The Science Guy and New York Times launch flood of fury against Noah's Ark Museum. Okay, so there's a lot of pun and stuff in that uh, flood of fury. Uh, but this article states, Bill Nye, the science guy, is once again ranting against people who believe the biblical account of creation with a little help from the New York slime, I mean Times. We're, <laughs> we're going to raise a generation of kids who are scientifically illiterate, Bill Nye said in an interview with the Times this week. Humans and ancient dinosaurs did not live at the same time, Nye argued. His statements come as the Times launched some antagonistic news quote coverage blasting the opening of a new museum the Ark Encounter uh, I don't think that's a news piece when you blast the opening of uh, that to me uh, comes under the heading of editorial comment um, or however you want to look at that uh, it's opinion the museum created by Answers in Genesis and it features a replica of Noah's Ark that opens July 7th in Kentucky. Times reporter Lori Goodstein starts her article with her own snarky diatribe against the founder of the museum, Ken Ham. In the beginning, Ken Ham made the Creation Museum in northern Kentucky and he saw that it was good at spreading his belief <laughs> that the Bible is a book of history. 
the universe is only 6,000 years old, and evolution is wrong and leading to our moral downfall, Goldstein writes. Uh, let's put a pause in there. Yeah. How snark snarky is definitely uh, the word there, and about as um, uh, nice as you can be. Uh, and, you know, she's mimicking her writing with the, the beginning of, of the book of Genesis. And, um, well, sorry about being her. The story goes on Ken Ham, a Christian apologist and president of Answers in Genesis, stands behind the young earth creationist view that believes God created the earth in six 24-hour days 6,000 years ago. The museum will feature dinosaurs on, the, on board the ark, Answers in Genesis discusses whether or not dinosaurs would have been on the ark in the statement on their website. AIG says, Dinosaurs could have fit on the ark because the ark was huge, large enough to hold the contents of more than 450 semi-trailers. That's a lot of stuff. AIG also stated, We point out that the Lord sent a pair of each unclean air-breathing land animal to the ark for Noah to care for and release into the post-flood world. Dinosaurs fit this description, so they would have been included on Noah's manifest. The New York Times article continued saying that the presentation of the ark encounter is wrong and that science has established that the earth is billions of years old and no worldwide flood occurred in the last 6,000 years. In a personal Facebook post, Ham slapped down the article and its author Stating, many reporters today don't report news. They use their position to push their obvious anti-biblical agenda and denigrate Christians and creationists. Uh, this is a, a theme that he has been saying several times because it's not the first time I heard this. Ham said, the reason we're building the ark is not as an entertainment center. I mean, it's not like a Disney or Universal just for anyone to go and have fun. It's a religious purpose. It's because we're Christians and we want to get the Christian message out. Our motive is to do the king's business until he comes. And that means preaching the gospel and defending the faith so that we can reach as many souls as we can with the greatest message of purpose, hope, and meaning. Even though that, even though we rebelled against our creator, he provided a way as a free gift so we can spend eternity with him. And, and I think Ken Ham just says it all. You know, Bill Nye, the science guy, can get mad. Uh, he acts like schools uh, are teaching biblical creation, which uh, is not the case. We're going to raise a generation of kids who are scientifically illiterate. Uh, that wouldn't be because of the creation story. That would be because of public school curriculum and things of sort. Uh, we'll be talking a lot more in the days and having on our site uh, things about Answers in Genesis and the Ark Encounter along with the Creation Museum in the days to come. There is a story that my wife will enjoy here, and it's titled... I see the picture. I like it already. Concealed Carrier Stops Nightclub Mass Shooting Just Weeks After Orlando Attack. Outstanding. A concealed carrier in Lyman, South Carolina nightclub appears to have stopped what could have easily turned into another mass shooting inside of a nightclub over the weekend. The licensed concealed carrier who is unidentified stopped a man who had already shot four people inside the club. According to a local media report, 
deputies said 32-year-old Jody Ray Thompson pulled out a gun after getting into an argument with another man and fired several rounds toward a crowd that had gathered out in front of the club. His rounds struck three victims and almost struck a fourth victim who in self-defense pulled his own weapon and fired, striking Thompson in the leg, Lieutenant Kevin Bobo said. Bobo said the man who shot Thompson has a valid concealed weapons permit. He cooperated with investigators and won't be facing any charges. When authorities arrived on the scene, it was initially thought that Thompson was just another victim of the shooting. It wasn't until they began interviewing witnesses that they determined he was actually the suspect. He's charged with four counts of attempted murder, possession of a weapon during the commission of a violent crime, and unlawful carrying of a weapon. All the victims are expected to survive and authorities to describe their injuries as non-life-threatening. Um, the bar where the incident took place is adjoined to a gas station and is surrounded by residential homes. Now, contrast that to Orlando and 49 people getting killed. What, what if one of those people in Orlando's nightclub would have been a concealed carry and killed that guy after four rounds had been shot? There may not have been. Well, if he killed him before then, you know. At least wounded him. Uh, I have a feeling a whole nightclub full of people could probably overtake a wounded man. Right. But on the flip side of that, now that now that, that made you feel good because that man did something very brave, stopped that man from hurting or killing other people. A mother went into her home with her two children and heard wrestling around, so she put the two kids in a room, went to investigate, found a man, a stranger, in her daughter's closet pulled her weapon and shot him, killed him, and they're wanting to charge her. I've heard the story. Uh, you've heard an update because the last I heard, they hadn't decided whether to charge or not to charge. Uh, I have a feeling she'll get good rep representation and either the, there will be no charges filed or well, I would she hope, will be acquitted. I would hope because, I'm sorry, let an intruder come in our home uh, you know, God help them because they're going to meet him. Well, one of the things that this uh, South Carolina story puts into play um, is South Carolina just recently relaxed uh, gun laws to allow concealed carriers to carry firearms into bars as long as they were not drinking. It appears that change in the law may have saved lives in this case. Well, finally somebody recognizes. Many gun rights proponents say that the more armed citizens could help prevent incidents like the Pulse nightclub attack in Orlando. They will point to this incident as an example of just that happening. But the strange thing is, you have to go looking for this story. Well, imagine that. It's not, um, it's not readily available, but you heard it here on the Ed Boston Podcast. Let's see. I got to keep rolling or else I will run out of time for subjects. Uh, where did I, there, got that and get rid of that. where to go and what to do. The United Nations. What about the United Nations? Well, uh, the United Nations sucks. <laughs> well, how do you really feel, Ed? And, well, I can't really think of anything else. This story here helps prove my point. 
the United Nations says taking your children to church violates their human rights. Oh, heavens. Asking children to attend Christian assemblies undermines their human rights, according to a United Nations committee. That's what the United Nations needs, is a bunch of committees. Two, two things that are totally inadequate in life, the United Nations and committees, for the most part. A highly controversial new report by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child expresses concern, quote unquote, that pupils in the UK are legally required to take part in a daily act of collective worship, which is wholly or mainly of a broadly Christian character. Wouldn't want anybody to be Christian in Heavens, the world. no. I bet you that they have not done that about the prayer rugs that the Muslims use. I bet they haven't either. Well, but I don't know that. So I'll give them a break. But I, I'm just saying, uh, the Muslims would have probably bombed the United Nations building <laughs> by now, if, which may not be a bad idea. <laughs> you know, do it at night when not, you know, the people are gone. Right. But I've said for years that the United Nations needs to go. It doesn't need to be in New York. Uh, conservative MP David Burroughs describes the criticism as ludicrous and said the government can respectfully put those kinds of reports in the bin where they belong, meaning the United Nations government. Or the UK's government can file it under File 13. The committee recommended that the government legal repeal legal provisions for compulsory attendance at collective worship. Its recommendations are not legally binding. Uh, parents can already withdraw their children from collective worship, but the committee wants children to be able to act independently of their parents. <laughs> then turn 18. I was going to say, they just <laughs> dig this hole deeper with every paragraph that goes by. We want these kids to be able to make their own decisions in life. Yeah, turn 18 and then you can. Um, Live under my roof and guess what? <laughs> uh, wow. The collective act of worship is not an indoctrination exercise. It is recognizing... Where did it go? It is recognizing and respecting the Christian heritage of the country and giving people an opportunity to reflect. The UN should spend more time doing its main job of preventing war and genocide rather than poking its nose in other countries' classrooms. And wonder how this guy really thinks. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, this coming on the heels of the UK's exit uh, from the European Union uh, maybe people in American government ought to take some lessons in things of late um, <laughs> the article finishes with the report contains 150 recommendations on where Britain could be contravening the UN's Charter on the Rights of the Child, including the freedom of parents to reasonably chastise their children. <laughs> Man, what a world we live in. Oh, you're making my head hurt. Well, it's probably going to continue to hurt, and I, I just got... The, these topics today came in like a flood. I was working on things. Trevor was sending me things. Every time I turned around, I was opening up a new window to have the story ready for tonight. Next thing you know, I got more topics than than what <laughs> I got time. <laughs> got time. And the bad thing is, is it's hard to judge time wise how much time to give each topic. Right. So I'm rushing, and I probably ought to just. <gasps> take a deep breath and slow down and take my time and 
And we'll be here this time next week. <laughs> uh, the UN has got no rights to be telling countries how to raise their children. Every country is different. I mean, I, granted, if they were looking out for abuse things and things like that, right. I'm not opposed to that. But whether or not you take your kid to church or not, come on. I mean, it's bad enough that... Um, that we've got the United Nations here in our country and we have to let people in that well like Ahmadinejad when he was president in Iran people like that into our country that have no business here the UN really 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 just reeks of one world government and just needs to be disbanded. In a story that I don't know if you can see a, a pattern in these stories. But the pattern seems to be people wanting to infringe upon the rights of Christians. I mean, we talk about Bill Nye, and he wants to infringe upon the rights of Christians to have the Ark Encounter. There, there's people that are highly, highly ticked off that the Ark Encounter is even existing. And this one... You think, how does this happen in America? Pentagon to investigate veterans' removal from military base for referring to God in a speech. Oh. The Pentagon has launched an investigation to review the Air Force's action against a 33-year veteran, Oscar Rodriguez, who was forcibly dragged away... Oh for giving a speech that included the word God at California's Travis Air Force Base in April. Oh, my goodness. Secretary of the Air Force, Deborah Lee James, ordered the Air Force Inspector General to review the Air Force's actions against Rodriguez two days after the group First Liberty, which defends religious freedoms of all Americans, sent a demand letter to the Air Force on behalf of the veteran. Mike Berry, the director of military affairs at First Liberty Institute, said, We view the Pentagon's action today as a positive first step, not only acknowledging that religious scripts may be used at retirement ceremonies, but also ensuring these kinds of situations are not repeated. Th this story continues to go downhill the longer I read. You, you'll see. I'm just, I'm speechless right now. Well... You're going to turn blue in a second because you're going to have no air going, oh, Lord, oxygen nice. going to your lungs. For many years, Rodriguez, who retired as a senior master sergeant in 2013, regularly performed a patriotic flag-folding speech at retirement ceremonies and civic and patriotic events. Master Sergeant Charles Chuck Robertson a U.S. Air Force veteran who retired in April of 2016 at Travis Air Force Base saw Rodriguez performing the flag folding speech at a friend's retirement ceremony. Moved by the speech, Robertson asked, personally asked Rodriguez to give the same speech at his own retirement ceremony. Seems like a reasonable request. Right. A speech about the flag and the folds. And right, all, and the reason that it's folded the way it is. I mean seems like no one in the whole world ought to get upset about that. When senior officials learned that Rodriguez's speech would mention God, they attempted to prevent Rodriguez from attending, but they didn't have the authority to do so. Robertson and Rodriguez tried to clear the speech through higher authorities at Travis Air Force Base, even offering to place notices on the door 
informing guests well, that the word God would be mentioned, but they received no response. I'm kind of disappointed that they even offered to put a note up that said we're going to say the word God. That, that's how politically correct the world has become, that, that people have to warn you in advance before saying the word God. At the ceremony, when Rodriguez began speaking, multiple airmen <coughs> physically assaulted him, oh my dragging him out of the ceremony. Travis Air Force Base officials then threw Rodriguez off the base, according to First Liberty. To even imagine that I would be removed while the American flag is being unfurled and open, the flag which represents freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, it's horrifying, Rodriguez was quoted as saying. I've given more than three decades of service to the military and made many sacrifices for my country. To have the Air Force assault me and drag me out of a retirement ceremony simply because my speech included the word God is something I never expected from our military. Oh. The Pentagon is really trying to backpedal on this one. They, I mean, they, they, they can't win the PR on this one, no way, because this man was a 33-year veteran of the military. 33 years. That's... My goodness. Uh, let's see. The Air Force, in a statement made last week, said, Air Force personnel may use a flag-folding ceremony script that is religious for retirement ceremonies. Since retirement ceremonies are personal in nature, the script reference for a flag-folding ceremony is at the discretion of the individual being honored and represents the member's views, not those of the Air Force. The Air Force places the highest value of the rights of its personnel in matters of religion and facilitates the free exercise of religion by its members. Boy, you wow. see, did the letter C-Y-A mean anything? Ain't that the truth? Holy cow. Even a Democratic senator spoke of Rodriguez's story from the Senate floor as an example of how our veterans pay a high price to serve our nation. Ugh. High price is an understatement. Too bad she didn't recognize his right to say God. Exactly. I mean, he did pay a high price for serving in the military for 33 years, but... Um, once again, we've got someone or some organization, something wanting to restrict the rights of Christians in America and around the world. It's not just in America that we have these problems. These problems uh, are becoming universal around the world. Wow. And next on the list of things or objects or groups or, let's just say, Satan trying to take Christians' religious freedoms away. The city of Colorado Springs, again, this article is up on trevordecker.com, um, under the heading, Colorado Pastor told he cannot advertise Jesus on benches. The city of Colorado Springs said Monday it is reviewing the advertising policies of Mountain Metro Transit after a local pastor was told his advertisements on bus benches in Colorado Springs would be barred if they used the name Jesus. Mountain Metro Transit recognizes that it acted hastily in dealing with this pastor and his advertisements, the city says. We are backpedaling again. Yeah, that, no the good thing about some of this stuff that we're reading is that people are saying enough's enough. And, you know, some people may say, you're just beating a dead horse over and over and over. Well, let's just continue to beat that dead horse until they quit killing the horse. The city attorney is working to ensure the advertisements comply with the law and no action regarding the advertisements will take place 
Until the re attorney finishes his review, the city said. The city issued the following statement on Monday. The city of Colorado Springs is carefully reviewing the advertising policies of Mountain Metro Transit in light of the advertising by Pastor Lawson Purdue of the Karis Christian Center. The city takes First Amendment issues very seriously and strives to fully comply with constitutional law. This commitment requires that advertisements and policies are regularly reviewed for content and legality. Mountain Metro Transit recognizes that it acted hastily in asking Pastor Purdue to change his messaging. The city attorney's office is working diligently to ensure that the advertising policies comply with the law. During this review, no action will be taken and Mountain Metro Transit will continue Pastor Purdue's advertisement as they currently appear. <laughs> They'd be doing the rope-a-dope. Yeah, exactly. You know, They'd be putting their hands up, covering their face, and letting them punch their arms, but covering their face the whole time. That's Muhammad Ali's rope-a-dope. As, as much backpedaling as they're doing, they're going to end up back where they become, back where they came from, instead of, you know, like riding a bicycle backwards or something. Well, the thing is, Come this on. church has been advertising on uh, the benches for three years using various Jesus-related campaigns. One year it was Celebrate Jesus. Another year it was Experience Jesus. And now the benches say Jesus is Lord. So this is not like a new thing. <laughs> it's probably somebody just saw it and went, okay, let's stir the pot. Uh... I didn't read the full article. You can get that at trevordecker.com. And I've read so many stories today that they're kind of running some of them together. Uh, I'm not going to say that because I don't think it was with this story. The church planned on renewing their contract with Jesus quote theme <laughs> in future advertisements as well so good for them for not backing down um, you know here's the thing the difference between conservatives and Christians and I'm not saying all inclusive but when libtards get offended by something like this or as in a bakery who won't bake a cake for a homosexual wedding people get fined businesses get put out of business yep. because of the fines are so hefty people they get, get threatened. sued their lives are get threatened and on this one all this guy wants to do is be able to put his advertising out right i don't know it's not it's not the Christian way to act like the world, but it almost makes you want to say, Christians like this man, or, or, or like the guy who said God in a speech, need to start suing. Mm -hmm. And maybe people, but that's not the right, that's not the right answer. The, the human side of me wants to say, that's the thing to do. Give it back to them the way they give it to you. But that's not what Jesus preaches. But boy, it sure is hard not to sometimes. It it just uh, <laughs> it's just such a it, it's just such a sham. Things that things that we've taken for granted for years as being normal are now no longer normal. <laughs> Our city, in, when we lived in Columbus, allowed gay pride flags to be flown on the downtown streets. And paid for it by taxpayers' expense. And everybody thinks that's the greatest thing in the world. This guy wants to put a message on 20 benches all over the entire community. That he personally is paying for. Yes. I mean, it's not like, it's not taxpayers' money. It's not, 
actually the city is making money right, off of absolutely. him. Right, absolutely. So, I mean, he's paying to have that done. It's, it's not a matter of having to ask somebody else to pay for it or whatever. Well, again, you can get that article over at trevordecker.com. Uh, Colorado pastor told he cannot advertise Jesus on benches. Oh, my goodness. This is another one that's going to not make you happy. Oh, Lord, this is an extra blood pressure night, blood pressure medicine night, isn't it? You may have heard this today or you may not have. Judge blocks Indiana genetic abnormality abortion law. Did you hear anything about that today? No. A federal judge blocked an Indiana law Thursday that would have banned abortions sought because of the fetus's genetic abnormalities, saying the state does not have the authority to limit a woman's reason for ending pregnancy. U.S. District Court Judge Tanya Walton Pratt granted a preliminary injunction sought by Planned Parenthood of Indiana and Kentucky, which argued that the law was unconstitutional and violated women's privacy rights. The law was set to take effect Friday. North Dakota is the only other state that prohibits abortions because of genetic abnormalities such as Down syndrome or because of the race, gender, or ancestries of a fetus. So what, what this is saying, the Indiana law says we will not allow you to perform abortions because your baby has Down syndrome. That's not a legitimate reason to have an abortion. Indiana was saying, and this is big in, in other countries, but you cannot have an abortion just because you're having a little girl, because you want to be male dominated. You can't have an abortion because your baby is of whatever color it is. That's, that's no reason to kill a baby. Now, it was a controversial um, law when it was enacted. Of course, Indiana is heavily conservative, dominated in the legislature with a Republican governor. So he signed it and it went into law. It was supposed to take effect. Laws take effect in Indiana on July 1st, and that's tomorrow. Pratt, the, who was the judge, said the Indiana law would go against U.S. Supreme Court rulings that had declared states may not prohibit a woman from seeking an abortion before a fetus is able to live outside the womb. She also said the state had not cited any exceptions to that standard. The lawsuit from Planned Parenthood also challenges the law's provision requiring that aborted fetuses be buried or cremated. Planned Parenthood currently disposes of remains by incineration, as with other medical tissue. Pratt's ruling blocks the burial or creation requ cremation requirement from taking effect. Uh, I guess Planned Parenthood would fight that because they want to be able to do whatever they like with... Well, they can't make money off of a, off of a baby's body that they have to bury or, or cremate. Well, that was my point. I was getting there. They Sorry, it jumped again. They wanted to be able to do what they want with baby parts. A prominent Indiana anti-abortion group urged the state to appeal... Um, Indiana Right to Life President Mike Fletcher said today a federal judge denied the civil rights of unborn children and then proceeded to equate aborted children to common medical waste by blocking dignified disposal. This ruling is an appalling human rights injustice. Um, And earlier this week, Texas, the Supreme Court struck down a Texas law that required doctors who perform abortions to have admitting privileges at nearby hospitals and forced clinics to meet standard-like 
hospital-like standards. So, you know, all these people who talk about, uh, worried about, you know, the safety of women and things like that, Texas was going to make them, the doctors who perform it, be just like any other surgeon and have admitting privileges at a hospital. No, that's not good. Huh. And they were going to force the clinics to meet hospital-like standards. You would think that people that were for women's health issues would applaud those kind of things. Wouldn't you think? And again, someone wants to take away the rights of those who believe that life begins at conception. Dun, dun, dun. I need some sound. I need some uh, sound bites. You know. Did, did you see the video I posted on Facebook today? Uh, I didn't have the heart to watch it. This baby was alive in the womb, moving, kicking. And if you watch that video, and you see that child moving, and you're still pro-abortion then you're just stupid. I seen well, that you said that and I, I couldn't I couldn't bring myself to watch it. The baby was gorgeous. Unfortunately it was not going to survive. Um, it was it was too small, too young. But everything that that child was going to be at birth was present right then and there. And contrary to what most people believe, everything that that child is going to be at birth is present at the moment of conception. Their DNA is present. Their, their, their whole entire makeup is, is present at the moment of conception. See, I gotta, I can't be, wow. Trevor says he's not watching. He's not watching it? It's probably different outcome than what it appears that it's going to be. And it absolutely is. It just shows the baby in, in the womb because it's completely enclosed in, the, in the, the bag of waters. It just shows the baby moving and kicking. It shows nothing graphic. It shows they don't cut the, ba the bag open. None of that. Unfortunately, the baby doesn't survive. But it shows that that child is completely formed. Well, now that you've totally explained it to me, maybe I'll go ahead and watch it. I was afraid that they were going to show... No, there's nothing graphic in that video. It just shows that that child is alive. It shows that that child can move. Well, you, that child... you can see just in the video inching its way forward that right. the baby is moving. Right, the, and, and they just move the... the, the bag of water around and the baby moves from side to side and you know they kind of nudge at it a little bit and the baby will curl its legs up and I mean there's nothing graphic in it it's amazing that that it's a human being in that in that sack and I just don't understand how someone that's pro-abortion can look at something like that and go, oh, it's just a blob of tissue. Because, I'm sorry, that blob of tissue has ten fingers, ten toes, two legs, two arms, a heartbeat, lungs, everything that, that needs to make a human is right there. Well, I think it would only be appropriate that we take a breath and listen to a song from Hillsong United.
All right. Well, that was Hillsong all the way back from 1994. Love it. That's Darlene Sheck, who got her start with Hillsong United. And um, she went on to become her own megastar on her own. And Hillsong has continued to grow to the point where they got their own television network now. So I'd say they um, mutually uh, help each other's careers quite Sounds well. Like. Because uh, that's one of the best praise and worship songs I of all time. Oh, yes, it is. Absolutely. The, it, it's just so... <sighs> It is. You know, after going at this for about an hour, and we needed a ah, moment. Absolutely. And so I'm glad that that's a song I had picked out already. Um, the um, Because in hour two, which just started two seconds ago, um we're going to get back into some more topics that are things that we got to point out, but um, Trevor's reminded me that uh, one year somebody sang Shout to the Lord on uh, American Idol. They and, did. It was amazing. And they cut the Jesus lyric out and Hillsong forced them to redo it the following night or get sued. And good for Hillsong. <laughs> See, that's that's where I'm coming from is that Christians, Christian organizations, people that follow Jesus Christ have got to become bold and not just sit back and take it wherever it's given. Absolutely. Because usually it's not given in a very good place. <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say about like that. I the way you say that, though. That was... Well, we just got to... We got to stop. The other side is not going to stop dishing it out. Absolutely but we not. certainly don't have to continue to take it. I mean, Satan is not going to give up. He is going to... He's going to double down even more. And if we really are living in the last days, it's going to get way worse. I don't know if we're living in the last days or if we're not living in the last days. I don't want to see it get way worse. I hope it's as bad as it's ever going to get. Jesus comes back and we all go to heaven. And that, but all of us that have done what we have to do to go to heaven. I wish everybody could go to heaven, but that's not the way it, it works. And... Well, uh, you know, and I don't say that morbidly or anything because heaven's going to be whatever number you can think of, infinity times greater than what it is here on this earth. Oh, heavens, yes. So why would we not want to get there? That's not to say we don't like it here on this earth. But boy, Christians, Christians have got to just continue to fight the good fight. The Bible talks about that, fighting the good fight. Absolutely. Well, we talked on Tuesday about the report on Benghazi we have talked before about um, Hillary's problems with her email and all the FBI probes and different things like that well on at the time the report was coming out on Benghazi uh, I want to play a, an audio clip of 
a, a reporter asking the attorney general if she thought it was proper that the sitting attorney general and President Bill Clinton met on an airplane in Arizona when his wife was under investigation by the Department of Justice. Um, <laughs> the libtards think this is okay. Listen to this. Developing tonight, the Department of Justice is leading a criminal investigation into Hillary Clinton's State Department emails and possibly the Clinton Foundation, but that did not keep Attorney General Loretta Lynch and former President Bill Clinton from having a cozy private meeting on her plane this week. Ms. Lynch says the meeting was unplanned and the investigations never came up. But legal experts say it looks bad. And Fox News producer Dan Gallo cornered Ms. Lynch on behalf of the Kelly file on that very question this afternoon. Watch. He did come over and say hello and speak to my husband and myself and um, talk about his grandchildren and his travels and, and things like that. So that was the extent of that. And no discussions were held in any cases or anything of that. And he didn't raise anything uh, about that either. You don't believe that that gives off the appearance of any impropriety while your agency is investigating uh, his wife? My agency is involved in a matter looking at um, State Department policies and issues. It's being handled by career investigators and career agents uh, who always follow the facts and the law uh, and do the same thorough and independent examination in this matter that they've, that they've done in all. So that's how that'll be handled. Thank you. All right. Now, we should just take her word for it because we know that the Attorney General's office under Barack Hussein Obama has been truthful about everything. And the Clintons are known to be upstanding and honest people. So we should just take her word for it, that even though his wife and possibly his foundation were under investigation, they talked about their grandkids. <laughs> wow. Are you kidding me? They talked about their grandkids. We're, we're, we're going to buy that. Well, of course. Um... And it does more than just look bad. <laughs> it's just wrong. It, if a judge was to do something like that, a lawyer would get that case thrown out of court and have a mistrial. The judge would probably get censured and be in trouble and... We've got the highest law enforcement person in the country, the Attorney General of the United States, secretly meeting on a private airplane with somebody who they're investigating their wife and possibly them. And now, forgive me for being cynical about this, but do I think that they just happened to be there at the same time? I don't know. Maybe they did. But if they were there at the same time, do you think that Bill Clinton cares enough about other people that he would just go onto their airplane and ask about their grand or tell them about his grandkids? Uh, no. That just does not fit the Bill Clinton mold to me. Bill Clinton's all about Bill Clinton. Hillary Clinton is all about Hillary Clinton and what they can get out of stuff. So he got if he got on that airplane, which he obviously did, it was to get information, to make sure she had his back, make sure she had his wife's back. Nobody will know because it was a private discussion by two people that should not be having a private discussion. Right. You know, some people might say, well, they're private discussions, just that. It's private. They shouldn't have been having the private discussion is the point. There are times in life where you don't have the right to speak to somebody. If somebody, if somebody puts a restraining order on you, you have lost the right to be around that person. Right. Maybe temporary, maybe permanent. 
if the Attorney General's office is investigating the Clintons or just Hillary Clinton, then the Attorney General does not have any business talking to somebody in her immediate family. And this is just okay. We'll find out more about Hillary's America when we listen to this trailer. Who are these Democrats? It is my judge. Dinesh D'Souza was sentenced on Tuesday to spend eight months in a confinement cell. It all began when the Obama administration tried to shut me up. The gang's all about stealing, man. What did I learn? All crime is about stealing. The big criminals are still at large. Didn't uh, see any reason to keep them. It's time to go behind the curtain and discover the soul of the Democratic Party. The Democrats support slavery. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. This Civil Rights Act will allow colored men to sit at the same table beside the white guest. Freezer has been swept under the rug. To cover the tracks of the Democratic Party. We've got to give them a little something. Plantation politics. The Democrats went from slavery to enslavement. Corrupt big city bosses, that's how you get corrupt unions. That's what does progressive actually mean? Social engineering and social control. I'm Margaret Singer. The opening video in the Democratic Convention in 2012, the government is the one thing we all belong to. What are these Democrats hiding? This is about buying and selling influence by foreign oligarchs and foreign governments. When you follow the money, there are very, very few coincidences. What if the goal of the Democratic Party is to steal the most valuable thing the world has ever produced? What if their plan is to steal America? Who will stop them now? That's the official trailer to Hillary's America. And it'll be coming out later this year on the Pure Flix label. It'll be in theaters around the country. Um, while we're speaking, I'm downloading a a clip from The View. And you look at me like, are you retarded? <laughs> but uh, the answer to that would be... And, you know that I don't mean that comment in a bad way toward anybody right. who oh, has that disability. Um, that's just what we used to always say when I was growing up. Instead of like, are you crazy? We use the term, are you retarded? I'm being politically correct right now, explaining myself on something. But... You look at me like I've gone stark raving mad, and, well, I kind of have, because anytime you play something from The View, uh, you risk having um, a stroke. <laughs> to say the least. Let's listen to what the libtard ladies of The View have to say about it's time for Americans to just move on from Benghazi. Hillary Clinton <laughs> says that after a Republican committee spent $7 million on an investigation into Benghazi and found no new information, it might be time to move on. 
But the NRA spent $2 million on a brand new ad all about it. Even the head of the committee, Congressman Trey Gowdy, won't say Hillary lied about Benghazi. What more is there to say? And, uh, you know, newspapers are saying it's still there. So, well, the I mean, of the New York the Times, the cover yeah. of the New York Times, which is the paper of record in this country, no matter what they tell you, says Benghazi panel finds no misdeeds by Clinton. So, I mean, that should be the last word. And yet the NRA is continuing to, you know, to aggravate everybody. And that's seven that's million dollars is our money. That's taxpayers' that's, money. That's the problem. I sign that piece is, of paper. Isn't that something? It's seven million dollars. This was the eighth investigation. Mm -hmm. and, and one and thing final. that really, again, and final, hopefully, the one thing that I found striking was that Dr. Ann Stevens, she was the, she is the sister of Ambassador Chris yeah. Stevens, who died during this horrible attack. Yeah. She said that she doesn't blame Hillary Clinton, that she doesn't blame Leon Panetta, but she does find some blame with Congress because had they provided a budget to increase security for all missions around the world, yeah. then some of the requests for more security in Libya would have been granted. Right. And that was a Republican Congress that didn't give enough money to provide the security in Libya. But you know, there always has Isn't to that be, fascinating? Right. There always yeah. has to be a fall guy. I know, you know, I'm not always into politics like some ladies are on this panel, but I do watch a lot of TV shows about it. And there's <laughs> always a fall guy. Yeah. There's always the big company that's doing something crazy, mm -hmm. and they have to have the head. And I feel sorry for her for be, her being that person that they had to put all that um, attention but, on. And it's not really just... need to get with the program, because it was 11 hours of testimony. Now everybody says she didn't do anything. So let, she's right. They it's do. enough. The State Department of Stonewalling saying that they wanted these documents and it, they did take a long time, over a year and a half, to relinquish those. But like you said, just said the NRA is using this. Yeah, don't 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 think twice. I mean, the Republicans are still going to use this against her because even if there was no guilt even involved, if, even they're the still going to say facts. trustworthy, <laughs> credibility. It makes much gonna sense. Use it against her. I just said the, the RNC is already emailing yeah. about yes, it. But this, the NRA but has asked makes, about you know, it. It makes no sense. You know, look, oh. if you're going to go after her. I mean, this is part of the problem. When people, you know, talk about, oh, she's not trustworthy, it's because people have done this. She mm -hmm. sat with the Republicans. She sat with everybody she was supposed to sit to. She's talked about everything. She didn't do anything. Walk away. Get something yeah. new. We're bored with it. But, you know, yeah. we're, we're bored. We're it's not as we're voting. We it's done. To, we seem to be in a post-fact era. You know, most facts. Most facts. No facts. Well, there, there's no facts. No, fact, no, no one is interested in facts anymore. I, I'll disagree you with know, you on that one because there, yes. I disagree with you on the facts because this particular report, even Trey Gowdy, like they mentioned Hillary Clinton's name fewer times in this report than the Democrats did, and they they were trying to figure out was the military at the ready. Uh, they wanted to know more about the documents but being they turned over. It, they they did. They did go over the facts. They already put it in. Exactly. Our, they already put it in our minds that it's her fault. Yes. And the exactly. problem with society. And social media is that once you say it one time, right. you can't get it out. It, it and sticks, and it that sticks. reputation and hasn't been able to survive. And, and we, you know, we've we've said okay to so many things that we know are not true. But you know, remember but when there were no what WMD in, in uh, Iraq? They decided no weapons of mass no weapons destruction. Of mass, there was never really an investigation into that. How come? Yeah. Just asking the question. Yeah. It's, it's, labeled it's labeled conspiracy no, no, theories. It's labeled conspiracy theories. No, no, they. Oh, so many things I could say. If they would have had an investigation into the weapons of mass, that's destruction, Joy Behar, not direction. Weapons of mass direction. Well, that right there shows how intelligent she is. They would have found that there were weapons of mass destruction and that they would have found out where they went and what happened to them. Uh... You know, everything that they said, they were talking about themselves. They're the ones who don't listen to facts. They're the ones who put stuff on social media and put it already in there. They're the ones who walk away and... And, uh, and when Whoopi Goldberg says, even we're bored with this, what that's saying to me is... We're bored with Benghazi, and I'm saying never forget Benghazi. Absolutely. I hope that she gets bored for the rest of her life until somebody pays the price for Benghazi. And there, my audience can stand up and cheer. Absolutely. That is, that is so pathetic. We're talking about human lives. And them saying that Trey Gowdy didn't say anything uh, bad about Hillary Clinton... Trey Gowdy 
took the high road and just said, read the report. That doesn't mean there's nothing bad in the report about Hillary. He's just saying, read it for yourself. Find out the facts. Them, them five women, and Can Candace wasn't on that day, them five women wouldn't know the facts of something about Hillary Clinton if it jumped up and bit them right on their behinds. You're right. They are pathetic. And they are what's wrong with America. Oh, absolutely. All the things that we've been talking about tonight, I guarantee you, guarantee you, at least Behar and Whoopi are on the opposite side of what Christianity is on. Guaranteed. I don't have any... If I had a million dollars stacked up right here on my, on my chair... I'd bet that million dollars, every penny of it. That's how confident I am in saying that. And that's why this show and everybody that can needs to stand up and say no to Hillary Clinton being in our White House by any means legally necessary. Any means legally necessary. She cannot be in our White House. She already had eight years with her husband. And that leads me right into my next story. Um, a man that worked in the Clinton White House is making quite a stir. Uh, well, his bestseller, Dereliction of Duty, actually came out in 2003. But his name is Buzz Patterson. And he is becoming quite... The, the hit uh, by um, selling out the Clintons for what they really are. And he knows because he was in he, he carried he carried the suitcase. You know, the suitcase with the nuclear things. Right. You know, that suitcase. Uh, Buzz Peterson on his or Patterson, I'm sorry, not Peterson, but Patterson on his Facebook page says, In my 2003 bestseller, Dereliction of Duty, I recounted a critical moment when President Bill Clinton and the United States could have averted the impending attacks of 9-11 and cut the head off the snake, Osama bin Laden. As I wrote then, the White House Situation Room was buzzing. It was the fall of 1998 and the National Security Council and the intelligence community we're tracking the whereabouts of Osama bin Laden, the shadowy mastermind of terrorist attacks on American targets overseas. They successful, successfully triangulated his location, yelled a sit-room watchstander. We've got him. Beneath the west wing of the White House, behind a vaulted steel door, the sit-room staff sprang into action. The watch officer notified National Security Advisor Sandy Berger Sir, we've located bin Laden. We have a two-hour window to strike. Characteristic of the Clinton administration, the weapons of choice would be Tomahawk missiles. They lob Tomahawk missiles all over the world, but they're highly ineffective, accuracy-wise, compared to, let's say, an Air Force bomber that can pinpoint Anyway, that's another discussion. No clandestine snatch by our special operations forces. No penetrating bombers or high-speed air, fighter aircraft flown by our Air Force or Navy forces. No risk of losing American lives. Sounds like a good thing. We don't want to risk losing our lives, but that's what the military does. Berger ambled down the stairwell and entered the sit room. He picked up the phone at one of the busy controller's consoles and called the president. <sighs> Amazingly, President Clinton was not available. Insert by Ed, he was probably with Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> Re go to the article. Berger tried again and again. Bin Laden was within striking distance. The window of opportunity was closing fast. The plan of attack was set, and the Tomahawk crews were ready. And Tomahawks 
are effective. I, I, I shouldn't have said that earlier. It's just that that was his weapon of choice and it used to irritate me then and it still irritates me now. For about an hour, Berger couldn't get the commander-in-chief on the line. From the Situation Room, they cannot get the commander-in-chief. <laughs> Though the president was always accompanied by military aides and the Secret Service, he was somehow unavailable. Berger stalked the Situation Room anxious and impatient. Finally, the president accepted Berger's call. There was a decision, or a discussion, there were pauses, and no decision. The president wanted to talk with his secretaries of defense and state. He wanted to study the issue further. Berger was forced to wait. The clock was ticking. The president eventually called back. He was still indecisive. He wanted more discussion. Berger alternated between phone calls and watching the clock. The NSC watch officer was convinced we had the right target. The intelligence sources were conclusive. The president, however, wanted a guaranteed hit or nothing at all. This time, it was nothing at all. We didn't pull the trigger. We studied, quote unquote, the issue until it was too late. The window of opportunity closed. Al-Qaeda's spiritual and organizational leaders slipped through the noose. This lost bin Laden hit typified the Clinton administration's ambivalent, indecisive way of dealing with terrorism. Ideology, ideologically, the Clinton administration was committed to the idea that most terrorists were misunderstood, had legitimate grievances, and could be appeased, which is why such military action as the administration authorized was so half-hearted and ineffective and designed more for show than for honestly eliminating the threat. Fast forward to September 11, 2012. Ambassador Christopher Stevens and the U.S. State Department diplomatic compound in Benghazi, Libya are under attack. Repeated requests from the consulate to the State Department, the Hillary Clinton State Department, had gone unanswered or been denied. Now the chickens were coming home to roost and radical Islamists had launched a coordinated and lethal attack on American diplomats, one that we had been warning was coming. The senior U.S. official presiding over the response from Washington, D.C. is Hillary Clinton. Thirteen hours later, four Americans, including Ambassador Stevens, have been brutally murdered. The response from Washington? Silence and immediate cover-up and deleted emails on a private server. The common denominator between September 11th, 2001 and September 11th, 2012, radic uh, on those radical Islamic attacks on America, what was the common denominator? denominator? Bill and Hillary Clinton. When the phone rings in the White House presidential residence, residence at 2 a.m. and a crisis confronts, we need, we deserve a leader, a commander who can make the tough decisions without regard for personal, political, expediency, or posture. It's been shown time and again that Clintons are not qualified, not equipped to assume that command. Our nation, our military, our diplomats deserve better. Let's not let them down yet again. Never forget, friends. Never forget. And that's at the Buzz Patterson page on Facebook. Um, He's putting out lots of good stuff. This is a man that has been there and is in the know. He knows the Clintons very, very, very well. And we know that Hillary has already been president for two terms. Yep. Because she definitely had more testicular fortitude than her husband did. And we already know that she is friend she takes billions of dollars into her foundation millions maybe uh, billions maybe overstating but at least millions of dollars into her foundation from middle eastern countries now do you think that she can be objective when it comes to launching an attack 
on the Middle East when it's necessary. By the way, we did launch an attack in the Middle East this week. We killed 250 ISIS soldiers, I'm told. Uh, I, I personally think that that was done to shut people up that's saying we don't ever do anything uh, when terrorism strikes us. Uh, if that was in response for Orlando, uh, I'm not taking anything away from the military success, but uh, it was maybe about three weeks too late. Um, well, 30 minutes on why Hillary Clinton should not be ever allowed anywhere on this side of a jail cell, much less the White House. She doesn't need to be in jail. She needs to be under the jail. Uh, speaking of ISIS, and, you know, remember, that's who... Um, Barack Hussein Obama called the, the JV team, ISIS, you remember that? They're just the JV team. CIA director, ISIS terror attack in the U.S. only a matter of time. Huh. Well, I'm thinking, first of all, ISIS has already had terrorist attacks in America right. numerous times, but there is a point to that. This article is from CBN News. Um, more details are emerging Thursday about a terror attack in Istanbul that left at least 42 dead and nearly 150 injured. Airports around the world are increasing security to, and a top U.S. security official warned it's only a matter of time until terrorists attempt a similar attack here. Now what, I won't read this all, but what they're talking about is a coordinated attack that ISIS itself carries out and not lone wolves that... Right have gone under the instructions of go out and kill as many Americans as you can. They're talking about the Istanbul attack was coordinated between three different people, timing, and, and so that's what he's talking about. That kind of, of basically almost a 9-11 type uh, of attack uh, that's highly coordinated. CIA director John Brennan said... If anybody here believes the U.S. homeland is hermetically sealed and that ISIL would not consider that being an attack at an airport, I would guard against that, CIA Director Brennan said. Brennan said ISIS is determined to kill as many people as possible and to carry out attacks abroad. He believes they will continue trying to penetrate American defenses. Uh, he credited effective homeland security measures and intelligence for uh, so far keeping the terror group unable to attack America directly uh, and again the article reminds us the Orlando and San Bernardino shootings were carried out by radicals inspired by ISIS but not under its direct control or were they we don't know they're dead They're talking about how airports are the perfect place to do the attacks because what's on the outside of an airport? Glass. Glass with an explosive like that is going to cause a lot more damage from a fragment standpoint. It's going to inflict mass, ca mass casualties. So... The CIA director is part of the Obama administration. Obama calls them the JV team. The Obama says that we're winning, and his CIA director says it's only a matter of time until they attack us on our home soil. That doesn't sound like winning to me. It sounds like we're being fed a line of hogwash 
and at least this guy's got enough cojones to to tell us <laughs> uh, don't don't be fooled they want to hit us here they're doing their best to hit us here and at some point they're going to hit us here yeah, that's what he's saying they're... and you know what will happen when they do they'll say take away guns well of course take away the guns Well, for all of you people that believe in the United States Constitution, believe that it's been an effective tool to govern our land uh, for over 240 years, um, um, There's an article, let's see where I got this from, the, the libertarianrepublic.com, federal judge Richard Posner sees absolutely no value in studying the Constitution. This man is a federal judge. Wow. Wow. You could not draw a better picture of what is wrong with the American legal system than Richard Posner did this by asserting his opinion of the U.S. Constitution. Posner condemned the document he has sworn an oath to defend, which is the basis of all U.S. law, a document of universally recognized historical importance, Posner, who sits on the Seventh Circuit, claims the Constitution is practically irrelevant in today's world. I see absolutely no value to a judge of spending decades, years, months, weeks, day, hour, minutes, or seconds studying the Constitution, the history of its enactment, its amendments, and its implication across the centuries, well, just a little more than two centuries, and of course, less than for many of the amendments he wrote in an op-ed for slate 18th century guys however smart could not foresee the culture technology etc of the 21st century duh Posner's dismissal of the constitution and its framers as out of date is devoid of reason to begin with the founders were greatly ahead of their time in regards to political thought and philosophy they set up a government without a monarchy at a time when such a thing was unheard of. They dared to declare that all men have inalienable rights inherent to their being, something civilization would take hundreds of years to achieve in practice, and they sought to embolden the individual and restrain the government, a rather progressive position for their time. The, founds, the founders were students of history, law, and philosophy. They all understood that time would lead to social progress and change. The Constitution was created with a process for amending it for that specific reason. Furthermore, several of the founders, most notably Jefferson and Franklin, were investors. Surely they understood that technological progress would occur, but changing social attitudes and technological innovations do not render government any less dangerous of an entity nor do they diminish the value of individuals' rights the Constitution protects. Well, the article here says some very interesting things. If the Second Amendment only applies to muskets, which is what they had at the time that it, it was written, and that's what people on the other side say. Well, they were talking about muskets. They weren't talking about assault rifles. Uh, like they could see into the future, you know, maybe they they appeared on Back to the Future, you know, and went ahead in time, and yeah. Does the, the First Amendment only apply to the printing presses? The First Amendment doesn't apply to the Internet? Mm. That's what they had back then, printing presses.
Well, it's a sad state of it. The, the Seventh Circuit, I believe, would be one step before the Supreme Court. And I could be wrong about that. So if I am, somebody point it out and, and let me know. Uh, uh, wow. Constitution is just a document written by old farts that don't know nothing. Wow. Hmm. And his opinions are included in the Seventh Circuit Court. Ugh. Jack Van Impey is going to be doing a show basically exposing Pope Francis for the fraud that he has done. He's going to be doing a special show on 10 things Pope Francis has done against the Catholic Church tradition and Christian Church in general. The show will be available on Saturday on the YouTube channel and Christian TV networks like Daystar throughout the week. Uh, Van Impey is putting out that he wants people to tell their friends. He's basically putting the reputation of his show on the line by exposing the Pope for what he really is. That's interesting. We'll get some links to YouTube's after that's up, and uh, we'll share those with people at edboston.com. going to take a minute and, and look at the same story written by two different organizations. The first one has a little bit less information because some of the information wasn't available at the time it was written. This is from CBN. The second article will be from Fox News. Now, that's the same Fox News that people think conservatives are crazy about, and and I'm going to try to show you that even with Fox News, you can't trust the mainstream media to present all the information. A teenage girl was stabbed to death Thursday morning as she lay in her bed at home in Jerusalem. Well, this story is from Jerusalem, Israel. An Arab terrorist from a nearby village climbed the security fence, entered her home, and stabbed the young lady. I'm not, her last name is Ariel. 13, repeatedly in her upper body. She was rushed to Jerusalem's medical center where she succumbed to her wounds. The terrorist, identified as 19-year-old Muhammad Nassar Taria also stabbed and seriously wounded a member of the community civil security squad who spotted the infiltrator on closed circuit cameras and went after him. The wounded guard managed to shoot and kill the infiltrator, a resident of the village where the girl lived on the outskirts of the Palestinian Authority controlled city of Hebron. His mother, meaning the terrorist's mother, told the local news in Hebron outlet that she was proud of her hero. My son is a hero. He made me proud. My son died as a martyr defending Jerusalem and the mosque. Praise be to Allah, Lord of the world, she said. She added that her son has joined the martyrs before him and he is not better than them. Allah willing, all of them will follow this path, all the youth of Palestine. Allah be praised. Terrorists could have been inspired by an interview with Fatah Central Committee member, and I can't pronounce his name, published earlier this week in an independent Palestinian news agency's report and translated by the Palestinian Media Watch. The quote from this man says, If you would ask me about my personal position, I would tell you every place you find an Israeli, 
cut off his head. Chairman Mohammed Abbas responded when the interviewer asked about normalization with Israel. Likewise, I am against talks, negotiations, meeting, and normalization in all its forms with the Israeli occupation. The coordinator of government activities in the territories released a statement saying, this kind of remark is reminiscent of places like Mosul and al Raqqa, controlled by Islamic State united with Israel reported. At the same time, this kind of incident is the reason for terror attacks like the one in Tel Aviv two weeks ago, in which four innocent Israelis were murdered and many others injured, the statement read, adding that it hinders progress toward developing cooperation in the, reading, in the region. The latest wave of terrorism, which began last September in that area, has left 37 dead and injured hundreds more. But we don't get upset about that because the Israelis just deserve every bad thing that happens to them. Okay, now let's go to Fox News. It's a newer article, and you can tell by the headline, Jewish girl, 13, stabbed to death in West Bank bedroom, was a U.S. citizen. I guess that makes all the difference in the world. I don't think so, but it makes it extra bad. It tells us that terrorists are targeting Americans even in Israel. Of course, we know that the terrorists equate Israel and America together. It's too bad that our administration doesn't equate Israel and America together. <laughs> the terrorists do, but our administration doesn't. A 13-year-old Jewish girl who was stabbed in her bed by a Palestinian attacker on Thursday was an American citizen, the State Department said. The girl was asleep in her home in the West Bank settlement when a 17-year-old, it said 19 in the other article, broke into the house and killed her before he was shot by security guards. Benjamin Netanyahu said, The horrifying murder of a young girl in her bed underscores the bloodlust and inhumanity of the incitement-driven terrorists that we are facing. The entire nation deeply identifies with this family's pain and declares to the murderers, You will not break us. Of course, in Washington, D.C., the State Department condemned in the strongest terms the outrageous terrorist attack. They condemned it. They didn't just condemn it. They condemned it in the strongest terms. This brutal act of terrorism is simply unconscionable. We expend our deepest condolences to the family. We also understand another individual was attacked, and we extend our hopes for a quick and full recovery. Um... The article then goes on to talk about how, in spite of the, the things that have been going on, as in the terrorist attacks with 37 dead, that Israel would make every effort to build up settlements in the West Bank, basically saying they're causing the problem themselves by doing that. Uh, The assaults were once near daily, but have become less frequent in recent months. Uh, my page scrolled too far. And, and the poor Palestinians, you know... Uh, They, this article doesn't say anything about the mother bragging about her son being a hero. We wouldn't want the American people to know that. Goodness, no. Um, 
the military closed the entrances of that neighborhood to all but humanitarian and medical cases as troops arrived at the family's home for investigation. The poor Palestinians are going to be punished for something a, a lone wolf terrorist did. Bleeding heart. Oh. And that's Fox News. If we go to CNN or the New York Slimes, they're probably dogging Netanyahu for the death. Oh, heavens to Betsy. Well, that is about going to do it. I'm looking at my open windows and none of them are topics for the show. <sighs> I'm wore out now. I bet you are. It's important, very important, that we stay up to date on what's going on in our country and around the world. We need to be vigilant on seeking information and not just from uh, the mainstream media. Some people call them the lamestream media. Um, we do our very best to find accurate information here. If we ever come upon a time where our information is wrong, uh, we ourselves uh, will correct ourselves if we need to. And if you can prove us wrong on any of our things that we put out, uh, not, by, not by using talking points, but by using facts, you know, those kind of things that the view says our side knows nothing about. Um, well, send them to us at ed at edboston.com and we will gladly correct ourselves. Um, I think we probably ought to close with uh, a word of prayer tonight. Father God in heaven, I thank you for this day that you've given us and this opportunity that we've had to bring news and current events to our friends and listeners to this show. Father, bless our country in spite of all of our terrible things. Bless us in spite of ourselves and help us as Christians to stand up as we heard many times tonight individuals and groups that have decided that enough is enough and that we're not going to take it lying down anymore. Father, bolden us, strengthen us, give us courage to do the right thing. Not what we think is the right thing, but what you think is the right thing, Father. Help us to seek your face and then go out and put our faith to work. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for this time you've allowed us to have together. Pray this all in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, that's going to do it, folks. Um, I'm uh, uh, tired. I'm sick and tired. <laughs> and we are going to end with a song like we did Tuesday. We're not going to come back and say goodbye. So for Trevor, who provides us with more information than we know what to do with, uh, for my wonderful wife, Amy, who is sitting here beside me and was able to help out a little bit tonight as she sits back and relaxes a little bit after a long 12-hour shift. This is Ed from the Ed Boston Podcast Network telling you to go out and do the right thing. Good night. Good night.
beautiful.